Good and welcome to join us today. We're coming to you live from our studios in Kokom Lemle. We're on DTT because we're free to on DSTV channel 421 and Go TV channel 125. We are your home of independent, fearless and credible journalism. Coming up this afternoon, Institute for Energy Security challenges President Ekofuado on a session that Dumso is now a thing of the past. For the past seven years, we have worked tirelessly to keep the lights on, and I am confident that the unfortunate era of Dumso will not return. Yes, um, we know that the power supply has, um, reliability has improved. However, we still have a deficit, a deficit of more than 200 megawatts to meet our peak demand. More as the TUC put pressure on government to solve doom sort now. Also, Yoko has failed. That's according to that's according to lawyer Martin Kwebu as the Attorney General advises Yoko against money laundering probe of former Sanitation Minister Cecilia Dapa. Mami Tiwa, the Dangwa, the Executive Secretary of Yoko, has been sleeping on the job. The first thing is, do you see the part of the letter saying that the money has been returned to the other part? That's the, that's the most important thing we should deal with right now. We have details of the AG's response. Also, Methodist Church Ghana joins calls for an urgent review of the free SHS policy to ensure better food and infrastructure for beneficiaries across the country. The system itself needs some review mm. so that we can fine tune it. Mm. And later, Vice President Dr. Mahmoud Baomia and MPP flag bearer touts the uh, faith based organizations and development partners are pledging to leverage their expertise when giving the nod. Development partners are our number one in the church and their faith based organization. How, how can we leverage this and give incentives to the church and to the faith based organizations? We're also live on Facebook, YouTube, Instagram, and next spaces at Joy News on TV. My personal handle is at the Nana Aisha. Please do stay for details. <laughs> Private legal practitioner Martin Kwebu has expressed his appointment in the Economic Organized Crime Office, Iyoko, for allowing frozen funds of Cecilia Dapa returned to her. His frustration follows an advice from the Office of the Attorney General and Ministry of Justice to Iyoko against pursuing money laundry investigations into the activities of former Sanitation Minister Cecilia Dapa. Following a request for advice from Iyoko on the matter, the Attorney General's Office responded in a letter dated April 25, 2024 to Yoko that the OSP office did not submit its collaborative investigation report to Yoko nor its inquiries regarding its findings except of that letter reads and I'll be sharing with you shortly on our screens uh, it reads that uh, Yoko should not continue with the money laundering uh, business. I'll be getting that and uh, we'll be sharing with you shortly. But lawyer Martin Kwebu says he's disappointed in Yukon how it handled the case. What is wrong? The secretary of Yoko has been sleeping on the job. The first thing is, do you see the part of the letter saying that the money has been returned to the other part? That's the, that's the most important thing we should deal with right now. How was that money returned to the other power without Yoko being on site to take it at the same time? Why do I say so? Mr. Kisei Jabin had been clear that he was going to return the money and hand over the file to Yoko. That docket, hand it over to Yoko. So how come that at the time they close to $600,000 
and over 2.7 million Ghana was being handed over physically, cash, cash, was being handed over. Yoko wasn't present on site to collect the money. But the rest of the things in the letter we can deal with. I, I'm sure we'll come to that. But this is the point we should make. Listen, Mami Tiwa Abidanka should be on her way out of that office. She should be out. Let's not play. Listen, it's too elementary. It's too elementary for us to tolerate this. He said Jabin came out publicly that I'm handing over this file. I'm handing over the cash. And so, at all costs, Yoko should have been present to collect that money. There can be no excuses and there can be no bats. And that's why I'm thinking that, not thinking, that we are calling on Mami Tiwa to resign. This is we had warned her. Mr. Jabin could not have handed over that money without Yoko being properly informed. So I am nailing the blame at the doorstep of Mami Tiwa and the Yoko boss that she allows the other part to take this money. Excerpts of that letter from the Attorney General's office reads, uh, two domestic staff of Madame Cecilia Dapa were put before the court for allegedly stealing 1 million and 300,000 euros in addition to other items. Now, that's these, uh, this is a chronology of events. Now, Cecilia Dapa resigned from her position as sanitation minister. President Ekofuado accepts her resignation. We'll be sharing with you that letter from the AG's office shortly uh, because the AG says that Yoko should con discontinue with the money laundering um, case. We'll be bringing you more on that and you can also log on to myjohnline.com to read more of that statement. Now, the Institute of Energy Security is challenging President Ecofuado on his assertion that the power challenges are now a thing of the past. It follows the Trade Union's Congress demand for the government to fix the power crisis. With many businesses coming to a standstill and others struggling to survive, the situation has become dire, with the ECG not yielding to calls for a load shedding timetable. Speaking on May Day, Secretary General of the TUC, Dr. Yalba, emphasize the agency of resolving the power crisis. Mr. President, it is regrettable that the people of Ghana have to experience doom so again. After all what we went through in the past, please do something about doom so now. Responding to the demands of the TUC, President Kofado said issues of maintenance and gas supply have now been resolved. According to him, there have been stable electricity supply with no load shedding anywhere in the country. He promised the situation will remain the same. Over the period, the issues surrounding maintenance of transformers and gas supply have been successfully resolved. Resolved resulting in a sufficient improvement in power supply reliability. Indeed, over the past few days, we have witnessed stable electricity supply across the country with no load shedding reported anywhere yesterday. For the past seven years, we have worked tirelessly to keep the lights on, and I am confident that the unfortunate era of doom so will not return. But the Institute for Energy Security is challenging the president on this. He says the power situation has not been resolved as suggested by the president. Listen to its executive director, Nana Moisi the seventh. Yes, um, we know that the power supply has, um, reliability has improved. However, we still have a deficit, a deficit of more than 200 megawatts to meet our peak demand. We did check um, from the ground and we found a disconnect between the present remarks and the reality on the ground. And it does appear that the present statement was made to just reassure the public and to address concerns raised by the leadership 
of labor union, but it does not accurately reflect the ongoing challenges in the power sector. Uh, it is possible, that is possible to the extent that we've seen an improvement in generation and that the deficit that existed uh, some four months, three months, a uh, month ago has reduced and that we are able to produce beyond 3,500 megawatts. And we are still able to produce, uh, to export part of this power to our neighbors, roughly about 110 megawatts, as compared to the 250 we're doing before the problem started. We, uh, this possible because uh, we have some fuel supply available now, but then we can't speak for government. How sustainable the supply will be is another thing to be discussed. The, the expectation is that um, gas flow and uh, liquid uh, fuel flow will be uh, improved, that um, all the plants available will also come on stream, because we don't have any problem with uh, uh, install capacity here. All that we pray is that gas will flow, and also God must be great, uh, you know, gracious to us to uh, give us more of the rain to support the hydro that I mentioned we on and Akosombo to produce more of that. If government is able, like I, I said earlier, to raise more revenue at the tail end of the value chain through the ECG and fairly distribute to all the utilities their, their own contribution to power generation, then of course they can maintain their system and assets and produce more of that. Vice President Flagbearer of the NPP, Dr. Mamadou Baumia, has emphasized the urgent need for land digitization in Ghana. His call comes a day after there was a shooting in Kaswa uh, of a military man uh, by land guards. Dr. Baumia says government is committed to the modernization of the land administration system and the enhancement of access to land-related services for all Ghanaians. One of the areas that we need to really solve is the land digitalization. We are doing where we are going to digitalize the whole process. You should be able to sit down at home and know who really owns this land. On your mobile phone, you are really going to get land guards. Today, you are working with land guards, and people are being killed over ownership. But once we digitalize the whole process, the courts will know in one minute who really owns this land because everything will be digitalized and we will use blockchain technology. Blockchain technology sounds fancy, but it's simple. It means once you use it, nobody can change that record. Nobody can change the record. That record is immutably solid. So once you apply blockchain technology to the listen, all the community that you tend to see at the lands commission that you be the files are missing, records are changed, all of that will be his, his history. And so and that can allow the country to develop. Because you, you cannot develop if you know, land ownership is in question. Investors will not come. You couldn't have a mortgage market. And so we're going to do a whole new thing. Before the COVID-19 pandemic, tuberculosis was one of the deadliest infectious diseases. It is estimated tuberculosis has caused more deaths throughout human history than any other infectious agent. Despite advancement in treatment and prevention, it remains a significant global health concern, particularly in regions with limited access to health care and resources. The National TB Programme says more children are at risk now and parents must be vigilant to help in early detection of the infection. There's more in this report. Prisoners, children, rural poor, persons living with HIV, minors and smokers are the key vulnerable population who easily contract tuberculosis due to factors like the quality of air in the environment where they find themselves. This is according to the findings of a research into tuberculosis by the National Tuberculosis Program. Senior lecturer and consultant at the School of Public Health, KNUST, Dr. Mohamed Aliyu, 
says tuberculosis is still a killer disease. Uh, generally, we know that TB is, is, is a public health problem and, and remains a significant uh, disease in a country. So we need certain interventions. We need interventions. We need to strengthen or improve our intervention to meet the, the, the needs of uh, the TB uh, population. A normal person being infected and, and not having a strong immune system would end up getting the disease. So there's the need for us to raise awareness, not only in the key vulnerable population, not only in the key vulnerable population, but also uh, the general population need to understand why there's a need for us to raise awareness. According to Dr. Aliu, the research was bedeviled by major challenges, thereby limiting the extent the study could explore. There's the legal implications and also um, the financial component. The legal implication is that, look, you can't expose, it's, it's, it's ethically not right in research for you to expose the locations of individuals who, from the onset, um, the activities are deemed illegal. So you can't expose them. Secondly, we, needed enough, we don't have enough funds to conduct this assessment. It's very important. NTP would better respond uh, to TB uh, they can control TB better if we actually uh, know exactly where these individuals who are at risk of vulnerable uh, for getting TB. We need to understand their lo locations, but however, we, we don't really have enough funds. Project lead Emanuela Bentum called on all stakeholders to join the fight against TB as it is claiming lives. TB is very risky and it is it was the number one deadliest disease before COVID, but it's still hanging around. COVID has been dealt with, but what are we doing about TB? TB still hangs around us. That is why we make sure to map TB key and vulnerable populations in Ghana in order to reduce TB in inequities. So we are not only bringing them on board, engaging and sensitizing key and vulnerable populations. We are also taking services to them, especially those who are not having access to TB services and care. So. We are on the agenda, leaving no one behind, and we are carrying everyone along. In as much as we are sensitizing these key populations, um, we are making sure to engage lawmakers and policy makers that will make policy decisions and uh, to suit TB key populations in order to meet their needs. So let's all call on our lawmakers and policy makers to do this for us in order to make sure our accountability is promoted. The National TB program has assured Ghanaians that it is working tirelessly to curb the rising cases of tuberculosis and urging affected persons to adhere to their prescriptions. The Methodist Church of Ghana has called for an urgent review of the free SHS policy to ensure better food and infrastructure for beneficiaries across the country, according to the presiding bishop of the church. Even though the relevance of the policy is not in doubt, a few adjustments must be made to enhance the quality of the nationwide program. Speaking on a car based Wesleyan TV, the most reverend Dr. Paul Kwabnabuafo noted the concerns with poor infrastructure and widespread reports of poor feeding require urgent attention from government. I remember at our uh, last uh, two years conference, mm. the president was there, and as part of my uh, address, I asked if we could review mm. the, the system. Mm. Uh, we, we, we are all uh, in, in for it. The free uh, SHS has come to help a mm. number of people. Expansion of access, for access, example. Yes, the, and even the numbers coming mm. in. And uh, for that one, nobody can fault it. It's, it's a good thing. And uh, people are taking advantage of it. But the structures, the system itself, need some review mm. so that we can fine tune it mm. by looking at the infrastructure right looking at the quality of the meals and what is being sent mm. in there Very uh, important. <laughs> those ones you see because uh going through the the, the system you need 
quality food, you need quality uh, ambience and all that. And a significant step towards the rejuvenation of coastal communities in Ghana, the West Africa Coastal Management Project has launched its operations with a strong commitment to restoring socioeconomic activities in the area. Led by project coordinators Nobel Waja and Ken Kinney, their initiative aims at revitalizing the coastal region, starting with Keta and Anglonga through sustainable practices and eco-friendly tourism. The project, which has been generously sponsored by the World Bank, kicked off with a series of engagements with local stakeholders, highlighting its core mission to uplift the communities and preserve the natural beauty of the coastal areas. Noble Waja, one of the project coordinators, emphasized the importance of the Waka project in restoring the livelihoods of residents while preserving the environment. Three tier components. Uh, the first level component is regional integration. Regional integration to mean that those processes and actions or ground realities that are in other regions or in other countries that may not be here or the vice versa, which countries can borrow from. So the synergy between uh, actions and processes that are in different countries because the project is happening in different countries. So the second level component is looking at policy legislation harmonization in our country. That is one area. So because the project can throw uh, out a challenge for certain existing legislations, programs and policies. So the project is also looking at how the project will become a conduit to mobilize, I mean to harness the ends of all those potential differential uh, legal or policy regimes. The third level, which is most of most important to why we are here, is what we call the sub-project level, which is going to look at physical infrastructure development to give mandates to coastal resilience. So those will be projects that will be done at the community level. It, can, it could involve uh, rehabilitation of existing infrastructures or Establishment. One of the key focuses of the project is the rejuvenation of the Lagoon Basin area with plans to transform it into a hub for ecotourism. This strategic move not only aims to attract visitors but also to create new economic opportunities for the residents of Keta and Anoga district. The executive director of the Development Institute and one of the coordinators of the project, Ken Kinney, elaborated on the vision for the land. Yes, um, along last, uh, the coastal communities, I would say, government and the World Bank have heard their concerns and want to do something about their plight. The worker project has been running along the coast of Ghana, along the coast of West Afri Africa, uh, from Senegal to, I mean, if you talk about West Africa, we're talking about West African coast. And that involves, that starting all the way from uh, Senegal to uh, Nigeria, that's West Africa. And the Waka project is formulated to support governments, nations, and our countries to, to uh, invest in coastal resilience for the community. So the project is looking at one, because it is a regional project, is looking at how to uh, harmonize good practices within the countries along West Africa. NGOs are brought into this project because uh, the World Bank, as a learning bank, has decided that they want to experiment how citizens will participate in such a project. Uh, they are supposed to, because citizens also have some knowledge, the project will tap on those knowledge, build their capacity, and they can use them to the maximum. A development expert, Joel Degg, was hopeful of a successful takeoff of the project implementation. The Waka project or the Waka Resip, West Africa Coastal Areas Resilience Investment Project, is a World Bank finance project for 
West African countries suffering from coastal erosion and flood issues. Yeah, so Ghana has been chosen as part of the countries to benefit from this project. Yeah, so in Ghana, the project is uh, taking place in uh, Greater Accra and Volta region. And in Volta region, it encompasses uh, three districts, the Anglongan district, the Keta municipality, and the Ketu uh, south municipality. These are the three districts east of the Volta estuary. And this place in Ghana is the, it's a hot spot. Uh, the most affected coastal uh, areas, so long as coastal erosion and tidal waves action is concerned. So this project has come to you know, protect the coast somehow and uh, using either the gray technology or the green technology, that's the nature-based technology, either the groins or the seawalls or the beach nourishment so that those who are suffering from the coastal uh, erosional activities will have some respite. So the project is looking at uh, communities like uh, Fuverme and uh, Keta and uh, Adina Salakopo Agaveji in the Ketu South District. So it is to you know, protect the coast and build resilience for the coastal community so far as the resource management is concerned. So as an individual, a resident of Keta and a native of Keta, of course, uh, I'm happy that this project has finally come because uh, Ghana is not the first person or the first country to enjoy this project. It's been done in other places like Cote d'Ivoire, Togo and Benin. Yeah, so this project coming to Ghana, especially Keta area, is a joy to some of us because we have been suffering from this coastal erosion and tidal wave and the flood issues for some time now. And we believe this project will be, you know, somehow a solution to this perennial uh, environmental threat that the area has suffered all these years. During the meetings with stakeholders, assurances were given that the worker project would prioritize the needs and aspirations of the community members. However, a four-member committee was formed to help with intermediaries. As the worker project gains momentum in Ghana, it stands as a beacon of hope for coastal regions across West Africa. Ivy Satoji for joining. The 2023 Joy News Impact Makers Award winner for the Bono region, Reverend Jefferson Kwesia Butcher, has applauded Joy News for its dedication and support to bringing positive change to the people in the region. Reverend Agbotro, the chief executive of Friends of Health Association, who plans to impact the lives of over 5,000 people this year, says the mileage given by Joy News has brought enormous support that will inure to the benefit of the beneficiaries. Precious Semevo has more. The first quarter cocktail meeting and fundraising of Friends of Health Association, FOHA, offered stakeholders, including volunteers, the chance to take stock and share ideas to improve the aim of saving lives and changing society. It was also to celebrate the chief executive of FOHA, Reverend Jefferson Kwesiak Botro, 2023 Joy News Impact Maker winner for his dedication and impactful drive in the Bono region. I believe that um, in the next 16 years, um, it will be a state banquet celebration, waiting in for the impact, not only in Ghana, but across the world. Being on a national television and joining news per se, it's not a cook-up or a make-up story. Uh, some 70 years to come, he will be gone, but his name will still be relevant. Reverend Jeff, this is a, a, a journey you have just started. The, the, the battle is going to be very tough. We will come on board to support you. Mr. Gautreau mentioned some areas for her is focusing on for 2024. In the next one year, we want to empower 5,000 people from the basic to the senior high and then at the university level in the area of teenage pregnancy advocacy, child marriage advocacy, skill development, and you are looking at uh, mentorship and career guidance for the youth because they are the future of the nation. So if we don't empower them, we cannot have a secure future. And then we are also looking at 
the medical outreaches that we are doing to screen more people on diabetes, hypertension, which is on the ascendancy, more people are dying of stroke, non-communicable disease. And to also raise fund and mobilize fund to support our community because all this hinges on financial support. He applauded Joy News for the continued support and mileage impacting the work of FOA. The last one year has been very interesting, but after Joy News awarded me, there are more recognition, more acceptance, in fact, more open doors in terms of people coming in to really support. The food project that we implemented was after the Joy News Impact Makers Award. And as I speak, there is an organization coming on board to support us to roll up a medical support project. And all this are because of the publicity Joy News has given to us, which is making people to see what we are doing. And thankfully, the project lead, we've been in touch with her, helping us a resource person that we couldn't have gotten access to. So Joy News Impact Makers Award, I've never seen other awards, they award you, they leave you to your faith. But they have been with us from day one up to now. Even inviting us to even come for the Impact Maker 2024 is remarkable. A new for her website, forhagana.com, was outdoored to help connect to the outside world and donors to aid for her to continue impacting society. Precious some of joy news. Sunyai. We're still live on Journey today. We're coming to you from our studios in Kokum Lemle. We're on DTT because we're free to wear. Let's take a break when we return. That's business. <laughs> Welcome to the business segment on Jane today with me, Emma Davis. LMI Holdings, a leading developer in Ghana's development space and also developers of the Tema Free Zones have been certified with an International Finance Corporation Green Buildings Edge certification. According to the Senior Country Manager of the International Finance Corporation, Carl Kehofer, his outfit is committed to supporting the private sector. He spoke to Joy Business. According to the senior country manager for the IFC, Carl Kerofa, the LMI Holdings deserves the certificate issued as it has been a visionary leader in innovation in Ghana. An optional program, but many of our clients choose to achieve it to meet this international standard um, energy and sustainable um, resource efficiency standard. Um, it's one of the largest standards globally, and in fact, over 93% of the buildings in Ghana are, are, that are green certified are actually EDGE certified. And it's, and it's a win-win for everybody. And in addition to first and foremost just doing the right thing, making the planet more livable, and making the environment in which these businesses operate in Ghana more sustainable for communities and stakeholders and employees. In addition, it, it's, a, it's cost savings in terms of water supply, in terms of energy supply, in terms of air conditioning and, and, and fuel supply. Uh, but you layer on top Top. And that's why the LMI warehouse is a bit unique in that the whole desire for greening of supply chains around the world is a growing trend. And so this uh, having a green manufacturing warehouse facility in Ghana makes supply chains in Ghana more green, more sustainable, and actually greater market access around the world for products manufactured in Ghana. The Chief Executive Officer for LMI Holdings, Kujobo Chue Duhine, adds, the certification is good and even though there is a financial aspect of it, the company wants to take an environmental issue serious. The EDGE certification establishes our uh, environmental credentials. It, it's at the forefront of whatever we do. Uh, it's at the forefront of whatever we do. Uh, and this is a certification for that. Um, going forward, LMI has decided that the environment, the social aspect, the governance aspect is going to take uh, a prominent uh, place, is going to be critical to our operations and this is an establishment of that. No, the, in fact, this is the start of it, I should say. Uh, this is just the beginning of it. Uh, our next uh, major development is the Dawa Industrial Zone. And once again, like I said before, the environment, the social aspect is going to be at the forefront of it. It's going to be in everything. It's going to be in our DNA, if I can say that. 
The Ghana Revenue Authority is pressing on its clients who pay taxes online to seek redress at any uh, of any technical issue with tax officers at its various offices in the country. The call follows a move by the authority to increase its online payments as a way of reducing queues at its office. There's more in this report. The tax clinic by the Ghana Revenue Authority was organized to serve as a platform for tax education and also support taxpayers in filing their returns for the year. As part of moves to increase online payments, the GRA has made efforts to provide taxpayers with the necessary short codes and online platforms to file their taxes. Speaking to journalists at the tax clinic, manager for Kimbu Public Sector Tax Office, Charles Isando Mainz, encouraged online taxpayers to use the channels to avoid any stress in tax payment. He, however, argued that taxpayers should seek redress in any tax payment concerns online. Uh, in the past, when this online filing had not started, you had our taxpayers queuing at our offices at the beginning of, at the end of every month of tax filing period. So management thought it wise that it would be very necessary that we get our taxpayers to file online. So in order to avoid situations where you have our taxpayers queuing in our offices in their numbers to file their returns. So this one, you can just sit in the comfort of your home or your office and then do the filing and then doing the payment. So it's one way. So filing online doesn't mean that if you have any challenges, you cannot walk to the offices of the uh, GRA to have your tax issues resolved. So our doors are always open for taxpayers to walk in when they are having any issue regarding their filing and payment of their taxes. Some of the participants at the tax clinic lauded the GRA for the initiative and urged others to take advantage to file their taxes. So far, my impression has been very good. The impression so far has been exciting. We've been taking through the new process in respect of how um, taxpayers who want to come to the GRA office to come and pay their tax, how to go through the tax process and how to file their tax returns. So, so far it's been a very good program, very productive. I think it's very good because it will help us just sit at your comfort zone and go online to file up your tax returns instead of coming here to waste all the time and be in queue. It's very, very good and it's very beneficial. So I think it's a good idea. The tax clinic is part of event to improve tax education in the country. That's all for business. I am Emma Davis. For more business news, do log on to myjoyonline.com. Up next is sports. Please stay. Time now to bring you sports on Joy News today with me, Muftar Nabila Abdullah. Some 12 Ghanaians will be going to France to serve as volunteers for this year's Paris Olympic Games. It is a part of the activities of ensuring that people develop the attitude of volunteering in major events. My colleague, Abdul Karim Benin, was at the uh, orientation program and comes through with this report. The event was held at Alliance Francais in Accra on Monday and Tuesday. The 10 volunteers were selected from various sporting federations in Ghana. The two-day pre-departure training was organized by the French Embassy in collaboration with France Volontaire. The training is aimed at equipping the volunteers with relevant knowledge about how to navigate their way around Paris and contain possible cultural shocks. Okay, uh, thank you. With the training that we, they've had so far, uh, we are confident that these young people are ready uh, to go and fully fulfill the mission for which they are embarking on their journey to France. And um, coming back to where are they going to be and how long are they going to be in France. You know, because this is a lot of investment from the French embassy or from the French government uh, into this program. And uh, initially we were thinking if they should go to France to just spend three weeks for the Olympic Games and volunteer and come back. Uh, that is costly, but it's too much short of short time for them to go to France and come back. So for them to really experience the French culture, we have planned in collaboration with France Volontaire, the institution I work with actually, to offer them a mission of eight months 
So starting from May to December, and some will be staying for one year. But when it's time for their Olympic Games mission, they will go to volunteer for the Olympic Games for three weeks, and afterward they will come back to uh, their first mission that they are doing. Volunteers say they are now better equipped to execute their duties at the 2024 Olympic Games. Uh, yes, actually, it's been a, uh, it's been an eye opener. Um, we've received a lot of information, helpful information uh, as to get in there, live how to live life, and a couple of other things regarding our work as volunteers as well. So yes, it's been very helpful. I think I'm equally uh, ready for the tax. Um, from the beginning, we are having many thoughts and prejudice about France. And for yesterday's seminar and today's seminar has been very insightful to us, and has been every uh, able to equip us with a lot of information, the weather, the people, how we'll be able to um, stay in France for the duration that will be uh, giving out our service to the French government and to the Olympic Games as well. The 10 volunteers will depart Ghana for France in May ahead of their mission during and after the Olympic Games. The second legs of the UEFA Champions League will be happening next week, Tuesday and Wednesday. And join the Joy Sports team as we'll be bringing you the commentary from Kita Lounge at Mataigo and the Heritage Bar at East Legon. So on Tuesday, we'll be at Mataigo and then on Wednesday, we'll be at East Legon for the UEFA Champions League second leg semi-final matches. We appreciate your time. Good afternoon, you welcome to the Showbiz segment with me, Jacqueline and Suma Yeboah. Now, for the very first time, history was made as a 60-year-old Argentinian woman defied stereotypes capturing the esteemed title of Miss Universe representing the province of Buenos Aires. Alejandra Marisa Rodriguez emerged victorious in the Miss Universe beauty pageant following the unprecedented removal of age restrictions. Originally from La Plata, the capital city of Argentina's Buenos Aires province, Rodriguez is not only a beauty queen, but also a seasoned lawyer and journalist. She now holds the distinction of being the first woman in her age group to secure such a prestigious title, marking a significant milestone in beauty pageant history. Her elegance, grace and radiant smile charmed both judges and spectators alike. With her sights set on the forthcoming Miss Universe Argentina pageant scheduled for May 25, Rodriguez remains undeterred in her pursuit of further accolades. Should she emerge victorious, she will advance to compete for the illustrious Miss Universe title slated for September, marking a significant milestone in her journey. Rodriguez's ascent to prominence coincides with a pivotal decision by the Miss Universe organization in September 2023 to eliminate age restrictions for contestants. In tandem with Rodriguez's groundbreaking achievement, other women are also making waves in the pageant arena, transcending age barriers to vie for coveted titles. <laughs> Well, congratulations to her for breaking the age barriers. Now, can you recall a time when the best part of your day was sitting in front of the television, eagerly anticipating the airing of your favorite Ghanaian TV show? Those were cherished moments of our childhood that made everything worthwhile. For Throwback Thursday, we take you down the memory lane of some unforgettable Ghanaian TV shows. <laughs> As we reminisce about our childhood, the cherished memories of our beloved TV shows are etched deep within our hearts, evoking a nostalgic journey back to a time of youthful innocence and freedom. Ghanaian television has consistently offered captivating storytelling, memorable characters, and impactful messages. Our first TV show that brings memories was Cheche Kule. It was a kids program that aired during the early 1990s. 
was directed and produced by George Lee and Uncle George. The show, which aired on Saturdays, involved entertaining activities coupled with educational information that gave kids the chance to learn new things while having fun. Things We Do For Love was about the youth and how they lived their lives and went about their things in school and at home, with their parents also coming in their way, trying to put them on track so they don't go astray. The story featured people like Pusha Ajite Anan, Sheikha Majid Michelle, and Yonam Jackie Apia, and others. Well, it's a wrap for the showbiz segment with me, Jacqueline, and Suma Yabwa. But Aisha, what was your favorite TV show growing up? <laughs> Don't even remember, but I remember Chichi Kule. Okay. And uh, I'm Tata. <laughs> things we do for Oprah. love. Yes, things we Oprah do for love. So and, and all of that, right? Thanks for bringing us showbiz. That'll be eight for showbiz, and that'll be eight for the bulletin this afternoon. My name is Aisha Brian. Log on to myjournaline.com. There's more of the news and updates of all the developing stories there. To enjoy the rest of our programs.